First, may I commend uh, President Bateman, his staff, the faculty, for a truly great things that BYU is doing on this campus and all over the world. You students are attending one of the greatest universities in the world. I hope you understand and know that. And further, I'd like to congratulate our basketball teams. <clears throat> I've chosen to speak to you today about something that is very close to my heart. I have been married to Sister Ballard, who's here with me on the stand for 50 years this August. The greatest day in my life was when I met Barbara Bowen. My greatest accomplishment was convincing her that I was the only true and living missionary among all those that she was dating. <laughs> it was the most important day when we were married in the Salt Lake Temple. We are the parents, as President Bateman has said, of uh, two sons and five daughters. Perhaps being the father of our five daughters and now the grandfather of 22 granddaughters makes me an expert on the subject of women. <laughs> Initially, I intended to speak to the women in this audience, but as I have considered the days that lie ahead, I believe this message is vital to both men and women. So I invite you men to pay strict attention. In future days, your lives will be increasingly influenced by the women who will become your wives, your daughters, and your associates with whom you will be privileged to work and serve in the church. Let me set the stage by reading from a letter that was sent recently to the church headquarters. This woman wrote, I have a wonderful husband and children whom I love deeply. I love the Lord and his church more than I can say. I know the church is true. I realize I shouldn't feel discouraged about who I am. Yet I have been going through an identity crisis most of my life. I have never dared utter these feelings out loud but have hidden them behind the huge, confident smile I wear to church every week. I have doubted if I had any value beyond my role as a wife and a mother. I have feared that men are that they might have joy, but that women are that they might be overlooked. I long to feel that I, as a woman, matter to the Lord. Today, I would like to respond to the issues that underlies the concern of this faithful woman. Does the Lord respect women? Do women matter to the Lord? The answer is yes, a resounding yes. Elder James E. Talmadge stated, the world's greatest champion of women and womanhood is Jesus Christ. I believe that. The first time the Lord acknowledged himself to be the Christ, it was to a Samaritan woman at Jacob's well. He taught her about living water and proclaimed simply, I am he. And it was Martha to whom he proclaimed, I am the resurrection and the life, and whomsoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And then during his greatest agony, as he hung on the cross, the Savior reached out to one person, his mother, when in the terrible but glorious moment he asked John the Beloved to care for her as though she were his son. Of this you may be certain, the Lord loves, especially loves, righteous women, women who are not only faithful but filled with faith are optimistic and cheerful about because they know who they are and where they are going. Women who are striving to live and to serve as women of God. There are those who suggest that males are favored of the Lord because they are, they are ordained to hold the priesthood. 
Anyone who believes this does not understand the great plan of happiness. The premortal and mortal natures of men and women were specified by the Lord Jehovah himself, and it is simply not possible within his character to diminish the roles and responsibilities of any of his children. As President Joseph Fielding Smith explained, the Lord offers to his daughters every spiritual gift and blessing that can be obtained by his sons. All of us, men and women alike, receive the gift of the Holy Ghost and are entitled to personal revelation. We may all take upon us the Lord's name because sons and daughters of God partake of the ordinances of the temple from which we emerge endowed with power, receive the fullness of the gospel, and achieve exaltation in the celestial kingdom. These spiritual blessings are available to men and women alike according to their faithfulness and their effort to receive them. The basic doctrinal purpose for the creation of the earth is to provide God's spirit children the continuation of the process of exaltation and eternal life. God said to Moses, And I, God, created man in mine own image. In the image of mine only begotten created I him, male and female created I them. And I, God, blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. The proclamation on the family confirms that God has not revoked nor changed this commandment. The First Presidency and the Twelve Apostles solemnly proclaim that marriage between a man and a woman is ordained of God and the family is the center, central to the Creator's plan for eternal destiny of His children. This doctrine sometimes causes women to ask, is a woman's value dependent exclusively upon her role as a wife and a mother? The answer is simple and obvious, no. Well, I hasten to add that there is nothing a woman can do that is more far-reaching with eternal impact than to rear her children to walk in righteousness. Motherhood and marital status are not the only measure of a woman's worth. Some women do not have the privilege of marrying or rearing children in this life. To the worthy, these blessings will come later. Men and women who do have the privilege of rearing children will, of course, be held accountable for that priceless, eternal stewardship. While there is simply not a more significant contribution you can make to society, to the church, or to the eternal destiny of our Father's children than what you will do as a mother or a father, motherhood and fatherhood are not the only measure of goodness or of one's acceptance before the Lord. Every righteous man and woman has a significant role to play in the onward march of the kingdom of God. I have a deep and abiding feeling about women and about the crucial difference they make in every important setting, particularly in the family and the church. I have spoken boldly about the role women must play in the council system of the church. We cannot fulfill our mission as a church without the inspired insight and support of women. For that reason, I'm concerned about what I see happening with some of our young women. Satan would have you dress, talk, and behave in unnatural and destructive ways in your relationship with young men. The adversary is having a heyday, 
distorting attitudes about gender and roles and about families and individual worth. He is the author of Mass Confusion about the value, the role, the contribution, and the unique nature of women. Today's popular culture, which is pre preached by every form of media from the silver screen to the internet, celebrates the sexy, saucy, socially aggressive woman. These distortions are seeping in to the thinking of some of our own women. My deep desire is to clearly is to clarify how we in the presiding councils of the church feel about the sisters of the church, how our heavenly father feels about his daughters and what he expects of them. My dear sisters, we believe in you. We believe in and are counting on your goodness and your strength and your propensity for virtue and valor, your kindness and courage, your strength and resilience. We believe in your mission as women of God. We believe that you are the emotional and sometimes spiritual glue that holds families together and often holds wards together. We believe that the church simply will not accomplish what it must without your faith and faithfulness, your innate tendency to put this, put the well-being of others ahead of your own, and your spiritual strength and tenacity. And we believe that God's plan is for you to become queens and to receive the highest blessings any woman can receive in time or eternity. Whereas Satan's plan is to get you so preoccupied about the glitzy, world's glitzy lie about women that you completely miss what you've come here to do and to become. Remember, he wants us to be as miserable as, as he is and be like unto himself. Never lose your precious identity by doing anything that would jeopardize the promised eternal future your Heavenly Father has provided for you. You young men, lest you get too comfortable why I focus on the women, you have a significant role in all of this. You are sometimes the reason our young women get distracted from their eternal mission here. Let the women in your life Know that you want them to be women of God and not women of the world. Of you, the Lord expects protection and safety for his daughters. Great will be your remorse if you should steal from anyone her virtue or purity. My earnest plea and prayer is that young men and young women will understand that our sisters have always been vital and eternal to the work of the Lord. Faithful women have labored valiantly in the cause of truth and righteousness from before the foundation of the world. In Je President Joseph F. Smith's vision of the redemption of the dead, he saw not only Father Adam and other prophets, but our glorious Mother Eve with many of her faithful daughters who had lived through the ages and worshiped the true and living God. Think about the incomparable role of Eve, whose actions set the motion, in motion the great plan of our Father. And what about Mary, the precious and chosen vessel who bore the Christ child? Surely no one would question the contributions made by these majestic women. Our dispensation is not without its heroines. Countless women from every continent and walk of life made dramatic contributions to the cause of Christ. Consider Lucy Mack Smith, the mother of the martyred prophets, Joseph and Hiram, and the grandmother of President Joseph F. Smith. Her resilience and righteousness under the most emotionally and spiritually taxing conditions 
surely influenced her prophet sons and set them firmly on the path towards fulfilling their ordained destiny. At this point, you may be thinking, but what about me and my contribution? I'm not Eve or Mary or even Lucy Mac, Lucy Mac Smith. I'm just regular, plain old me. Is there something about my contribution that is significant to the Lord? Does he really need me? Remember the righteous who are not highly visible are valued too. And in the Book of Mormon, a Book of Mormon prophet said, are no less serviceable unto the people. President Spencer W. Kimball responds, responded to that question in this way, both a righteous man and a righteous woman are a blessing to all those whom their lives touch. In the world before we came here, faithful women were given certain assignments, while faithful men were foreordained to certain priesthood tasks. While we do not now remember the particulars, we are accountable for those things which long ago were expected of us. Every sister, <clears throat> every sister in this church who has made covenants with the Lord has a divine mandate to help save souls, to lead the women of the world, to strengthen the homes of Zion, and to build the kingdom of God. Sister Eliza R. Snow, the second general president of the Relief Society, said that every sister in this church should be a preacher of righteousness because we have greater and higher privileges than any other females on the face of the earth. Every sister who stands for truth and righteousness diminishes the influences of evil. Every sister who strengthens and protects her family is doing the work of God. Every sister who lives as a woman of God becomes a beacon for others to follow and plants seeds of righteous influence that will be harvested for decades to come. Every sister who makes and keeps covenants becomes an instrument in the hands of God. I've been drawn to an interchange between God the Father and His eldest and only begotten Son, who is ulti whose ultimate example of living up to one's premortal promises is before us. When God asked who would come to the earth to prepare a way for all mankind, to be saved and strengthened and blessed, it was Jesus Christ who said simply, Here am I, send me. Just as the Savior stepped forward to fulfill his divine responsibilities, we have the challenge and responsibility to do likewise. If you're wondering if you make a difference to the Lord, imagine the impact you make you make commitments such as the following. You make commitments such as the following. Father, if you need a woman to rear children in righteousness, here am I, send me. If you need a woman who is, uh, will shun vulgarity and dress modestly and speak with dignity and show the world how joyous it is to keep the commandments, here am I send me. If you need a woman who can resist the alluring temptations of the world by keeping her eyes fixed on eternity, here am I, send me. If you need a woman of faithful steadiness, here am I, send me. Between now and the day the Lord comes again, he needs every woman in every family, in every ward, in every community, in every nation who will step forward in righteousness and say by their words and their actions, here am I, send me. My question today is, will you be one of those women? Will you men who hold the priesthood answer a similar call? Now I know most of you want to, but how will you do it? 
how in a world filled with deceptive messages about women and the family and the significance of both to the Lord, will you perpetually respond to the Lord and say, here am I, send me. For those who really want to live up to and who are for those, at all costs want to repent if necessary and who want to see through Satan's deceptions, I have two suggestions. First, listen to and follow those whom you sustain as prophets, seers, and revelators. And second, learn to hear the voice of the Spirit or the voice of the Lord as communicated by the power of the Holy Ghost. I cannot stress enough the importance of listening to and following the prophet and the apostles. In today's world, where 24 hours a day the media's talking heads spew forth conflicting opinions, where men and women are jockeying for everything from your money to your vote, there is one clear, unpolluted, unbiased voice that you can always count on, and that is the voice of the living prophet and the apostles. Their only motive is the everlasting welfare of your souls. Think of it. Think about the value of having a source of information you can always count on that will always have your eternal interest that's <clears throat> at heart and that will always provide inspired truth. That is a phenomenal gift and guide. Just four months ago, President Hinckley spoke in a church-wide fireside to you. Have you studied his message and identified things you need to avoid or to do differently? I know a 17-year-old who just prior to the prophet's talk had pierced her ears a second time. She came home from the fireside, took off the second set of earrings, and simply said to her parents, if President Hinckley says we should only wear one set of earrings, that's good enough for me. Wearing two pairs of earrings may or may not have eternal impact for this young woman. But her willingness to obey the prophet will. And if she will obey him now on something relatively simple, how much easier it will be to follow him when greater issues are at stake. <clears throat> Today, brothers and sisters, I make you a promise. It's a simple one, but it's true. If you will listen to the living prophet and the apostles and heed our counsel, we will not lead you astray. I want you to avoid the snares of Satan. If you need direction when a choice is in front of you and this puzzling and perplexing uh, world we're in, learn to hear the voice of the Lord as communicated through the Holy Ghost. And then, of course, do what it tells you to do. Nephi taught clearly the Holy Ghost is the gift of God unto those who diligently seek Him, and that dilig he that diligently seeketh shall find. The stunning reality, my dear young brothers and sisters, is that you control how close you are to the Lord. You determine just how clear <clears throat> and readily available promptings are from the Holy, Ghost, the Holy Ghost will be in your life. You determine this by your actions, by your attitude, by your choices you make, by the things you watch and wear and listen to and read, and by how consistently and sincerely you invite the Spirit into your life. Contemplate for a moment the extent and the impact of this blessing. You have been given a gift that when exercised and respected will give you answers to all of the confusing, thorning questions and problems you will face in your life. I can only imagine some of the questions you're facing right now. 
Should you marry the young man you're now dating or not? Should you finish your degree or not? Should you serve a mission or not? What career should you pursue? Why pursue a career with vigor when all you've ever really wanted to do is to be a mother? <clears throat> As life progresses, how will you respond to the challenges that will inevitably come? Will you know where to turn for peace and consolation if you are called upon to bury a child as two of our own children have done? Or if a child threatens to stray away from the gospel? How will you know what to do when you face financial reverses? Where will you turn for insight and inspiration when you are called upon to lead in your ward or stake? You young men are facing all of these similar kinds of questions. To all of you, there is only one way to safely and confidently meet the obstacles and opportunities that are part of life's path. First, listen to the prophet and the apostles. Study the principles we teach. Then take those principles to the Lord and ask him how you should apply them in your life. Ask him to influence your thoughts, temper your actions, and guide your steps. Counsel with the Lord in all thy doings, and he will direct thee for good. He will communicate with you through the power and the presence of the Holy Ghost. There are several things that greatly enhance our ability to understand the promptings and power of the Holy Ghost, and thereby here to thereby be able to hear the voice of God. Let me give those to you. First is fasting and prayer. When the sons of Messiah were united with Alma the Younger, they rejoiced in their reunion and, and acknowledged that because they had given themselves to much prayer and fasting, they had been gifted with the spirit of prophecy and revelation, and that when they taught, they taught with power and the authority of God. The second is immersing yourselves in the scriptures. You've heard this over and over again. The word of God will tell you in all things what you should do. The scriptures are a conduit for personal revelation. Your generation is much more versed in Holy Writ than was mine at your age. You have been taught to read and study the scriptures. I urge you to intensify your study of them. I promise that your ability to hear the voice of the Lord as communicated through the Holy Ghost will increase and improve if you'll do this. The third is prepare to spend time in the house of the Lord. When the time appropriately comes for you to go to the temple, you will leave the temple armed with power and with the promise that as we grow up in our knowledge of the Lord, we will receive a fullness of the Holy Ghost. The temple is a place of personal revelation. If you are endowed, visit the temple regularly. If you are not, prepare yourselves to enter. For inside the doors of the temple rests the power that will fortify you against the vicissitudes of life. The fourth is listening to the counsel of your mother and your father. They are wise and experienced. Share with them, as my children have shared with me, your fears and concerns. Seek blessings from your father. If for some reason he's not worthy or able to uh, give you a blessing, go to your bishop or the stake president. They love you and will count it a privilege to bless your life. You should also receive your patriarchal blessing. Fifth is obedience and repentance. There are certain things you simply cannot do if you want to have the Holy Ghost with you. It is not possible to listen to vulgar lyrics, watch movies filled with sexual innuendo, tamper with porn pornography on the internet, 
or anywhere else for that matter, take the name of the Lord in vain, wear revealing or inappropriate clothing, compromise in any way the law of chastity, or, or disregard the values of true manhood or womanhood, and expect the Holy Ghost to remain with you. Whenever anyone participates in those activities, it should not be a surprise if feelings of loneliness, discouragement, and unworthiness follow. Do not make the choice to go it alone, rather than have the Spirit of the Lord to guide you, to protect you, to prompt you, to warn you, and to fill you with peace. Repent if you need to, so you can enjoy the companionship of the Spirit. Women and men who can hear the voice of the Lord and who respond to those promptings become invaluable instruments in, the, in His hands. I'll never forget an experience I had following a state conference. I was asked to participate in the blessing of a young woman your age who was suffering with cancer. The family were converts and they had found peace through the promptings of the Spirit. Prior to our giving the blessing to this dear young sister, she said to me these words, Elder Ballard, I'm not afraid to die, but I would like to live here with my family. I'm prepared to accept the will of my Heavenly Father. Please bless me to find peace and to know that he will be with me. What faith, insight, and courage the Spirit had blessed her with. A few months later, the family advised me that Heavenly Father had called her home. She died in peace, and the family lived in peace because they were familiar with the Spirit. One of the sweetest messages the Spirit will rely is how the Lord feels about you. And that reassurance will strengthen you in a way that almost nothing else can. Now, finally, I turn again to you, dear sisters. You have such a profound, innate spiritual ability to hear the voice of the Good Shepherd. You need never wonder again if you have worth in the sight of the Lord and to the brethren in the presiding councils of the Church. We love you. We cherish you. We respect you. Never doubt that your influence is absolutely vital to preserving the family and to assisting the growth of the spiritual vitality of this church. This church will not reach its foreordained destiny without you. We men simply cannot nurture like you nurture. Most of us don't have the sensitivity, spiritual and otherwise, that by your eternal nature you inherently have. Your influence on families with children, youth, and with men is singular. Your natural-born nurturers, because of these unusual gifts and talents, you are vital to taking the gospel to all of the world, to demonstrating that there is joy in living the way the prophets have counseled us to live. More than ever before, we need women of faith, virtue, vision, and charity, as the Relief Society Declaration proclaims. We need women who can hear and will respond to the voice of the Lord, women who at all costs will defend and protect the family. We don't need women who want to be like men, sound like men, dress like men, and unfortunately drive like some men <laughs> or act like men. We do need women who rejoice in their womanhood and have a spiritual confirmation of their identity, their value, and their eternal destiny. Above all, we need women who will stand up for truth, righteousness, and decry every evil at every turn and simply say, Lord, here am I. Send me. I bear my witness and testimony to you this morning, my beloved young members of this church, that you are precious, 
that this is the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The kingdom of God will roll forth until it fills the entire earth. It is for you to be a beacon and a banner to the entire world to show the women and the men of the world in whom there is such a natural disposition in the women to do good and to seek after things of the Spirit, what is right and what is true. I simply say to you this morning, God bless the women of the church. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.